Hello everybody, welcome back to the workshop. So in this video, I wanna take and talk real quick about poor tooling design choices. Now, this isn't at, directed at anybody except myself. So sit back and uh, get ready to have a good lark with me. So one of the things that I have noticed is the progression of my tooling over the years. I have several toolboxes full of different hand tools that I have made in the past uh, 11 years that I have been doing blacksmithing for and it's amazing to kind of see the progression of not only the thought process behind the tooling but what I'm using the tooling for and how I'm taking and changing from what I've learned about the messed up tooling that I've made in the past to more efficient or long-term tooling that I will be making in the future. Or so I think until another decade passes and then I'll realize that all that tooling was garbage and I need to make new tooling as well. Um, hindsight is always better than foresight. So right here I've got some nice 1080, uh, it's right around a 1080 series or 1084 type series. A high carbon steel. This is just like a regular carbon steel. This isn't anything special, no real crazy alloys. And then I've also got stuff that I'm making tooling that needs to withstand a lot more heat out of H13. Uh, and I am learning about the difficulties with working with H13. And I'm going to experiment around uh, here in the next not too distant future with stuff like S7, which is more of an impact resistant steel, as where H13 is more of a wear resistant steel. So it is harder than all get out. But it brings me to my point that, you know, you're going to have some janky looking tooling in your blacksmithing career, like what you see over here to the left. I started with an ideal where I had saw a guy uh, at, oh, I believe it was Sofa Quad State uh, Roundup many, many years ago. And I saw that he had some really neat tools that he was working under a power hammer with. And then he worked under a step hammer with. And then he worked with a striker with. And that tooling was these little short bob tooling that you see here. This is just like a little tiny set hammer. And this is actually holding up OK. It's the only tool over here that's really holding up the OK besides the slitting tool. But I designed it wrong altogether. But these tools were made out of 1045, which was a poor material choice for something so small. Uh, I was not, it's not, 1045 is a great tough steel, but it is not a hard steel. And so therefore, whenever you make, you know, thinner things or smaller things, it has a tendency to work hard in a bit and then end up breaking when you're making things that are too thin. Or if you get your temper wrong, you end up getting something that's crookeder than a dog's leg at the end of it. If you make your tooling too thin, like what you see here, an example of this uh, little slot punch that I had made. I haven't even fixed this because I just figured, well, I'm going to make a different slot punch at some time and I'll make it out of some proper steel that can handle uh, the abuse. Something like a 5160 or a 4140 uh, would be a much better choice for thin material like this or even better yet, if it's going to be working hot billets like hammer heads, then you may even want to go up to something like H13 or S7 in air hardening steel because it can really take the high temperatures. H13 is marvelous for that, taking super high temperatures without any deformation. But so anyways, I started with a tooling ideal like this. You have one pair of tongs and you can grab multiple different pieces multiple different tools, punches, you know, chisels, things like that. And I thought, man, that, that is just slick. That's what I want to do. So the only steel that I had on hand at time was 1045. And you can look at, if I brought you guys up real close, this stuff is rough. The fuller groove around it. Uh, about the only thing that was clean was the striking, was the surface that was going to be engaging the metal but the striking surfaces and everything, this was not a clean forging to begin with. And so it just kind of made things less desirable in the long runs. But each one of these tools have bends or they have breakage. They have cracks forming, stress cracks from using them for so long. 
Uh, they did hold up for quite a while, and then some things failed almost immediately, like this uh, slot punch that you see here. This was just too narrow of a design and a profile. So over here you have something that is more of my most recent creations. In fact, I use some of these tools here, especially like this, this drift, this hammer eye drift, for that 30 pound sledgehammer that I made a little while back. I'll put a link up here on screen now and one in the description if you want to watch me forge that. Uh, and this was done out of H13. And it needed to be because there was 30 pounds of hot steel and when you knock this when we knocked this back out, this thing was glowing red hot. And so you really needed something that wasn't going to deform. So I went ahead and decided to make myself some dev several different size hammer eye drifts for tooling out of that as well, because this is going to be a lot more robust and a heck of a lot more robust than something that's this thin. So now that's getting into more professional tooling. I've got stuff like this. It's a slot punch. Again, it's meant there's a big pair of tongs that holds this. Uh, this is just one style of slot punch I was playing with. I ended up liking the slitter style punch a lot better. It's just more like a uh, rounded edge chisel. I ended up liking the way that that slit through the material a lot quicker. So I've altered some of my different designs coming in the future for the way that those have worked. And then, of course, you have the tried and true method clear over here that I have accumulated over the years of just odds and ends, uh, mild steel drifts and tooling. And that's perfectly fine to make your drifts if you're not going to be employing these into like really hard work or hard labor or hard service. As long as you're engaging hot steel with the cold drift you'll be fine, you won't get that much deformation, and nothing that you can't take a few seconds and clean up on a grinder real quick. Um, and these are just different slot punches and drifts and stuff. So I completely redesigned my small, thin tooling, and what got me to think about redesigning it was this little puppy right here. Um, this thing right here, hopefully you guys can see it, it has a little arch to it. It's got a little half inch radius arch. And that was for taking and doing like a centerpiece on a Gothic style door knocker. So it was made to make a like a center ridge rounded on a Gothic style door knocker. And I made it wrong in a couple different ways. One, I made a slot punched hole in it in order for me to take and put a stick in here and then use this down the piece. The problem is that puts you right in line with the piece. So as I would take and use it to slot punch down, my handle would have to be right in line with the hot piece. It would have been much better if it was over here so I could actually see what I was doing. So that was one of my mistakes with it. But one of the biggest mistakes that I did is I made this too thin on the outside. There's nothing that supports there's nothing that supports these outside uh, lips here, and so therefore I have broken this tool several times. This used to be a lot longer than what it is now, but I had to whack it off and re-grind at that point in time. And of course, you know, that just makes them a baby tool that's not really worth a whole lot. So what I did with my new design, I'm still using a tong method. I changed up the type of tongs, tool holding tongs that I'm going to be using. Uh, and I redesigned my piece to now have a nice bevel. If you guys can see that there, there is a nice bevel to the piece. And that nice little 60 degree bevel does exactly what I wanted this tool to do but it didn't. So this tool doesn't actually do as good as what this tool does and so now I'm happy that I've made that adjustment and now I'm going through and working on the rest of my set. So let this be an encouragement to you. I know a lot of times you can see somebody online that seems like they have all their stuff together. They have all their apples in one basket. None of their marbles are rolling around or scrolling around on the floor. And that's just simply not the case. They most likely have tried and failed more times than you. And that means you need to get out there and start trying and failing and having victories and having losses yourself. And, you know, creating a scrap pile. <laughs> and this doesn't represent the amount of tools that I've broken 
heat treated wrong, threw in the scrap, in the scrapper, uh, trashed things that are sitting at the bottom of my quench tank. And that is kind of how a good way of you gauging that you're actually doing something. Now you don't want to always be ruining tools. And so if you're always find yourself doing that and that's a particular struggle of yours, I highly suggest you take a class with somebody who's known for doing tooling. If you can get on a class with somebody that is highly knowledgeable about doing tooling and things like that. Now, the last thing I'll say before I go is n there is no really just one way or one right way of making tooling. I know a lot of times it's easy for us to think that in blacksmithing, just because somebody shows you something that works, well, that must be the only way of doing it, right? Uh, that is a completely, that, that's a completely wrong assessment because there's multiple ways of making usually the same type of tool. There's multiple processes to get to the same result. And there's multiple heat treating options for sometimes the same material. Like this 1080, for instance, you can take and harden this in water, but then you can also harden it in oil. It depends on what you are trying to take and use the tool for. If you just need surface resistance, but you're not going to have impact on this, you can hard it, harden it in water. So say you're gonna do something like files, make files out of this 1080 stuff, you could do that very easily and harden it in water and a file's not taking impact, a lot of shock. But if you're gonna run these under a power hammer or something of that nature, that's going to put a lot of stress and strain and impact into this piece, that would stress it out even more if it was water, water hardened and tempered back. So you take and harden it in oil, which will give you a slightly softer quench medium. Now, I could go on for days, and I could be told I'm wrong for days when it comes to the high carbon steel. But again, just look up some metallurgy books and you'll see that usually hardening and tempering is not just a straight line across the graft and you hit this point in this temperature and that's exactly what it needs to be. A lot of manufacturers, when they're making and tooling, it's a wave, it's a curve. So at certain points, it will harden and it will do certain things for you. And it's important to take and research that about the steel you're working with before you get to hardening and tempering. Again, taking a class with somebody who really knows their stuff when it comes to the hardening and tempering of tools, and I'm talking about they make hundreds of tools a year, will be highly beneficial for you if you plan on making your own tools. So that's it for today. Let me know what you thought of this video in the comment section down below. I hope that was somewhat encouraging for you uh, to look at some of my mess ups and some of my failures. And uh, as you can see, it's just a pile of them. Uh, they're not really good for anything at this point. I'm gonna keep them around, let them kick around for a bit more. Uh, but again, they're basically going to go in the bin and then I'm going to work with my new tools. So that's it for today. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Uh, if you made it this far in the video, say Roy's a cool tool. <laughs> We're just gonna do that, hashtag Roy's a tool. You could just say that in the, in the, and get away with it this, just this one time in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for your support with the watch time of this channel. It means a lot. Uh, to me that you guys are a sponsor of this channel by doing that. And also, if you'd like to take and support us financially here at Christ Center IORGS, a great way of doing that is going and checking out our website at blacksmithpdfs.com. We've got a great great bunch of templates up there and several other different ebooks that you guys can go check out, and it's a great way to support this channel. As always, God bless you, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.